Okay, good evening, everybody, and you're very welcome um, to our webinar tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I know the weather is beautiful today, so it's not always nice to be sitting in front of your computer, but we think this is going to be quite beneficial for people who are transitioning from second level into third level, or perhaps returning to on-campus learning after the pandemic. So appreciate you all being here, and we hope that you find tonight both beneficial and interesting. So just to kind of give you a rundown of how tonight's going to go, I'm going to speak for a few minutes and give you a bit of an overview of the new website. And then we have Lauren and Colin, who have very kindly offered their time tonight, who have both been students and who both use the website. So they're going to give you a rundown on what they think is beneficial from it, along with their own experience and maybe some words of wisdom for going to college. And then we have Billy Redmond, who is going to tell you guys, what are your options if you didn't get the points that you really wanted, or perhaps the course that you wanted? Because there's always other options out there, and Billy is a wealth of knowledge on this. So don't worry, there will be other options for you. And um, if it's okay with everybody, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen briefly. Okay. So this is the autism friendly HEI.ie website that we just launched last week. And so far, we've had really good positive feedback about it. But I want to draw your attention to a couple of sections in particular that I think you will find really beneficial. So when you sign into the uh, web page, this is what your home screen is going to look like. And you can see up the top, home, about us. And then we have three sections of resources, academic life, college life, and daily life. And then we have our little resources button here, and there's some downloadable um, sheets on that, some resources like recipes, and we'll take a brief look at them. Then we have the contact us button here. And what's really important is this feedback button. I'm going to show you this first. So when you click on that and you scroll down, it gives you an option to give your name, phone number, email, and a message that will go to as I am, and I will get to see it. And the purpose of this is that we want your feedback, honest feedback on the website, and how useful you find it. And perhaps can you think of other resources that would be really good to add or maybe change some that are already existing? Because we are very much aware this is a new resource and it's a living document. So we want to make sure that we're changing it to meet the needs of people that are using it. So it'd be really good for you to give feedback, both positive and suggestions as well. So in addition to that, then we're going to look at um, the 360 videos that were created um, in DCU. And the purpose of these videos is to give you an idea of what it's like to be on campus for those of you that have not been yet, could have started college last year and been online learning, or you could be new to college from secondary school. So if you go into resources over here on the right and you scroll down, you can see here the different tabs that are available. So you have student stories and they're in the form of interviews where you can hear about the real life experience of students who've already been to college and the tips that they can give you to make your education journey easier and much more fulfilled. Then you have some simple recipes, which again, if you have a recipe of your own that you'd like to share and think other people would like, you can send that in to me. And then we have this virtual tour here. So I'm going to just click on it to give you a brief idea of what it looks like. So this is what you will come to. And when you press play, you'll get an explainer about how to use this and what the functions of it are. So I'm just going to play it here briefly for a second. Hi, welcome to your 360 view of a college campus. This is DCU Dublin. And I am here to tell you about the three scenes that we have explored in detail for you. So you'll see once you hit start, three buttons before you. Each button represents a common scene that you will encounter in college. The canteen, the student area and a lecture hall. In each scene you will have the option to navigate through the room. You can do this on a PC using your mouse to click and hold and then drag your view to different parts of the room. Using a touch screen, you press down and hold and then go left and right by swiping. In each of the scenes, you'll have access to further information. So the further information can include things like what the coffee machine sounds like, or if the chair squeaks in the lecture hall. 
the way you access them is simply to click and read the information or hear the sound provided. Um, we've been quite thorough in gathering as much information as we can so that you can have as full a college experience as possible and prepare yourself as much as you can basically and um, I hope you enjoy your little tour and that you got a lot from it. Um, click start to begin. As students enter and leave the lecture hall, they'll fold and unfold the chairs, which may squeak or clap. Okay, I won't go through all of that um, virtual tour, but I will show you now the rest of the functions. So if I can get it to go back. Yeah, so just to say when you're on the virtual tour, that um, little explainer at the beginning is really beneficial. And I would suggest playing around with it a little bit. And as you come up across each tab, you will see down the bottom, there is a series of little dots in the bottom right hand corner. And they will fill in as you've come across different parts that may bother you. You could be um, sensitive to the noise. You know, it could be due to the loud sounds in the canteen. It could be due to the bright lights in the lecture hall. But each one explains to you what it's like. There are some sounds that you can hear what it would be like to be in that environment. And some of the information is in written text too. But it's really important that you play around with it and you look around at the different areas. So the canteen, the lecture hall and the student area. And it will really help you get a good idea of what it's like to be on campus. So in addition to that, then in the virtual tour, we have the helpful resources here, which you can go into. OK, so it tells you lots of different things. What will college be like, your workload and how to manage it, your program, the difference between school and university, the elected roles in college and so on and so forth. There is a wealth of information. And just to say where the information came from was we did a selection of surveys that went out to college students and students in secondary school who came up with, you know, they answered questions to decide what would they like from college? What information do they feel that they need would benefit them personally? So we try to cover everything as much as we can, meeting the needs of the students and going with their own ideas and suggestions. But again, if you can think of something extra, please do let us know because we will add it to the website as we go. And one other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this right here, the accessibility options. So on your page to the left is this little guy right here. And if you click in there, you can change all of this to meet your own needs. So you can highlight, you can use, change the font to meet your own needs, you know, a virtual keyboard, your contrast, all of that. So it can be as accessible as possible. If you have any questions about the website at all and would like to ask them after tonight, at any stage, you can go back to that feedback form. It's going to stay there on the website. So please do put your questions or comments in there because we're very interested to hear what you think about it. And we feel it as I am, that it's going to be so beneficial. and We think it functions really well. But of course, we can't read the minds of everybody who's going to use it. So we would be delighted to hear your feedback and we'll welcome it all. So thank you very much. It's just a very brief overview of the website. I would suggest you get on there and you play around with it, especially the 360 virtual tour, because there is a lot to see. So then without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to Lauren. And I'd ask Lauren just to introduce herself and tell a little bit about your background maybe. And then yeah, we'll leave it up to you then to cover what you would like to cover. So thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. So my name's Lauren. I'm 22 and I'm studying psychology currently in NCI. Um, a bit of what I do, I'm a Montessori teacher and I love working with kids, especially kids that are on the spectrum because I feel like we have a little connection together. So that's what I'm hoping to base my career path down upon. So I suppose I just want to talk about my college experiences because I've had three very different experiences um, since leaving secondary school. 
So the first one would be, um, as soon as I left secondary school, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I was good at sports, so I said, I'll do a sports management course. Now, I didn't research into what the transition from school to college would be, because I thought I didn't need to. And at the time, I wasn't actually diagnosed on the spectrum. So I thought I'd be fine. You know, I did struggle in school, but I thought that, you know, I'll just get on with it like I always have and it'll be fine. But that was furthest from the case. So first of all, I suppose the initial setting of the college actually was quite daunting for me. You know, the little things that some people might not have thought of, like, again, the bright lights in the room or the rumbling noise of the projector, and it all quite irritated me. And as well as the little sensory triggers that I had, um, the social aspect of college, I found quite hard. You know, I was a female who wanted to fit in and have this popular image in college. And I, I tried to, you know, mask my own, you know, personal views in order to fit in with others. I was, you know, mimicking other people's um, personalities to fit in with them. And I suppose it kind of led me down a path of going to social events that I wouldn't have wanted to do. You know, I was doing things that I, you know, that were against my morals, you know, when I was just going down a path that just wasn't for me. And I suppose that was quite hard. You know, I didn't understand why I was finding college so hard, why I was, you know, masking who I was just to be friends with people. I had no idea. And I suppose the like one word I can put on that whole college experience was just confusing, you know, as well as the mental health struggles I had with trying to fit in and just, you know, not being able to commute on a train with the large groups. I had no idea who I was and I eventually got so you know angry and upset and you know just figuring out why was I here I dropped out after the Christmas exams I am um, and I think partially the reason for this was that I didn't reach out for the supports that were available to me you know I was struggling and I didn't go to my friends that I had from secondary school I didn't go to family and I definitely didn't reach out to the college alumni at the time and I think that was one of my biggest and my hugest mistakes so I just thought, you know, college wasn't for me, you know, maybe, you know, I'm just not the college person. So I gave it a break. Um, but eventually my family encouraged me to go back to education, which was, you know, a, a blessing in disguise. And I eventually did a childcare course in a PLC. And I had mixed feelings about it at the time as well. You know, I was still struggling with the social aspect and commuting again was the same problem. So I was still feeling upset and confused. But um, you know, there was other aspects where, you know, the teachers, they are kind of connected with you on more of a personal level. So, you know, they were more willing to help you. If you were able to talk to them a bit, you know, more on, again, a personal level, which I found quite nice. But again, I remember myself from the level eight and I said, you know, I don't want to be that person again. So I shut off completely. And again, I was left confused. So I, I withdrew myself from the class. You know, I didn't engage in, in anybody in the classroom in fear that I would lose my morals again from the last year, which again, didn't do me any justice. And again, reiterating the point of support, which I'll get to at the end. But eventually we came up against, um, we came up to a module in autism and we were learning about it and something kind of really resonated with me. It stuck with me. And I started connecting the dots of my life and my previous level eight experience. And I went, oh, hang on. I think I might actually be autistic. <laughs> you know what? This is, this is resonating with me a little bit here. So I took the time, came home. I was researching on my own, you know, trying to find, you know, online quizzes and, you know, some other people's experience of being autistic. But I never had that one support, that one website, like the website that we've just developed there to just give you everything and every little piece of information that you could have. I was left on my own devices. Now, it took a long time for me to realize, you know, maybe I need external help with this. I need to get tested and maybe formally diagnosed. And I did. But during this time, I really realized my um, interest and love for figuring out how the brain works. So I, you know, enrolled myself now in my psychology course and I'm in my third year. And in November of my first year, I was diagnosed on the spectrum. And I suppose as soon as I got the diagnosis, I kind of realized, you know, I can't do this on my own anymore. You know, I don't have all the information here. I need to reach out for someone. And I did. Um, I made an appointment with the learning support officer in NCI and we had a little chat and we were, had a little discussion about, you know, the problems I might face in college. Let it be the exams. I might need extra time. I might need a smaller room. Um, I am also dyspraxic and have dyscalculia, so I might need a text to speech. You know, there were so many options that I was never, ever aware of and something that might have helped me previously in secondary school or in, you know, my previous level eight that I wasn't aware of. 
but not only was I given, you know, the physical support, you know, of the here's a, you know, scribe pen and here's extra time. I was also given a listening ear, you know, someone actually sat me down and said, look, if you are struggling or if you are having any problems, you know, you can come and chat with us and you can sit with us and let us know and we can try and solve a problem, which was really comforting to me, to be honest. And it's something that has changed my aspect of my academic career and my educational career because I previously went from in my level eight, shutting off, not letting anyone know, struggling deeply. And I just got on with this, but it led me to dropping out and, you know, having this, you know, I'd call it my midlife crisis at the age of 20, you know, and I suppose it's just, it's changed everything because reaching out to someone in the college has made me realize that there is always someone there that is willing to support you and listen to you and actually wants to see you succeed. Um, and no problem is too big for them. They, you know, they are brilliant. And I am sure that in every college, you will find someone there that is willing to listen to you and to support any need that you think that you might, that you might need. Um, and as well as that, like on a mental health um, basis, like I know I have struggled um, personally with mental health issues. Um, and I just want to stress the importance really of reaching out to someone in the college that it, or it could be a friend or a family member or anyone that you feel closely connected to, because I just want to reiterate the point that, you know, if you don't reach out to someone and you keep it all in, it'll suppress and it'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, I, I suppose when I was in college, especially now I'm in NCI, I'm able to reach out to a friend and I say, do you want to go for a walk? Do you want to do something small? I'm not feeling great. Um, and that's one of the big pointers I want to get across here is, you know, there's no disadvantage to reaching out to someone, you know, that there's always going to be someone there listening to you. And I know it might feel scary um, because college is a very scary and overwhelming place. But there is always, always, always going to be someone there. And if, if you're in NCI and you see me walking around, don't, don't be afraid to pull me for a little chat. I'm always there um, because it is very, very important. I know college can be quite a scary place for any person, but I know for people on the spectrum, it can be, you know, a lot more. It, it can be quite scary. So there's always support there. Um, so that's been my college experience, you know, and my, again, my, I want to point across support, support, support. It's always there. <laughs> so as well as that, with the website, I know I'm a big researcher. I love to research things and I have lots of questions about things. So when I go to somewhere new, that's, you know, I've never been before. I need to know the exact layout of what it looks like. And what I find really beneficial from this website is the virtual tour. And I know we touched on that at the start because say, I remember when I was coming into NCI, I didn't have my autism diagnosis, but I was researching, I was looking at videos, pictures, constantly trying to figure out what this place looked like so I could prepare myself. So I did not want to be left as distraught as I was in the previous, previous college courses. Um, but it was hard because I didn't have, again, this one outlet to go to, to just look and kind of feel a sense of relief. It's like, oh, there's everything in this website. I didn't have that. So the virtual tour for me is extremely beneficial. You know, I, again, had the problem with the rumbling noise from a projector and the bright lights in the room. It, it can prepare you for that. And now I know that the lecture hall in DCU might not look the same in NCI or might not look the same in UCD, but it'll give you a general idea of what to prepare for when you do come into college. And I find that extremely, extremely helpful. And as I suppose as well as that, um, the student stories for me, I know, again, I wish I had something like that previously because I was left to my own devices to be researching and finding out how other people deal with being autistic and, and their tips and tricks. Um, so I suppose reading this student stories or even listening to some of the videos there it'll give you a, a a great idea of what to expect in college how to manage certain things in college you know other people's experiences you can relate to them and not feel so alone you can maybe relate to a specific thing go oh well I'm not the only one feeling like that so it's okay and again it's about having that support there so if you are feeling stressed and anxious about something there might be something there in the student stories or within the videos that you might be able to connect with and find something useful and beneficial to you afterwards which i think is absolutely brilliant um so yeah i've probably done that really quick <laughs> because i had it time for 15 <laughs> minutes but it's probably been about less than 10. <laughs> that's so. it's brilliant Lauren. you've really really covered you know, the benefits of it and your own experience, which is really yeah. important because many people we know on the spectrum have a stop start approach to education where they may start one course and realize it's not for them or the environment's not for them. So I think you did a brilliant job of explaining that. And more importantly, 
how to look after yourself and your mental yeah. health. So brilliant. And thank you so much. If I could ask you for one word of wisdom for people or one phrase of wisdom, what do you think you would say to a new student going into third level? You are never as alone as you think you are. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you, Lauren. That was absolutely really good. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much. And again, we might have time at the end for questions. So if anybody has a question for Lauren at the end, I'm sure she'll be happy to answer that. Definitely. Okay, so we'll move on then to Colin, who will give us a little bit about his experience and tell us about his very, very background in education. Take it away, Colm. Thanks very much for that uh, intro. Uh, Aoife, hopefully my, uh, my slides are sharing there at the moment. Someone can confirm that, yeah, that's brilliant. So, um, so my name's Colin McNamee and I'm just after completing a master's, Master of Arts in Educational Practice. Um, but if I was to tell you how far, so I turned um, 47 just last month. Uh, so I'm definitely the, the, the oldie in, in the room, uh, but just showed you that it's never too late um, to get to where you want to go. And I have promised my, my wife that the PhD will have to wait until I'm no longer working because I think she'd kill me if I went for it now. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about my background, about you know what I'm doing now, and you know how I've kind of arrived at, at where I am now, and how I look at at my autism and my neurodiversity. Because in addition to being autistic, I'm also dyslexic. I have an official diagnosis of ADHD, uh, and I have social anxiety and depression. Uh, and on top of that, a, a bit like Lauren, I would say I'm 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 definitely dyspraxic, uh, mentally clumsy is the best way of describing me. Um, and how all those things kind of, you know, led me to where I was. Now, the first thing I'd say is, like, you know, I, I did my leaving cert back in 1992. So that is nearly 30 years ago. But the one thing I figured listening to Lauren there was, like, in many ways, the experience hasn't changed that much. It's such a high pressure exam. It's such a high pressure situation. School, like in Ireland, we, we don't change things very often. So, you know, even the marking system. So I, I was the first year of what most people would recognize as the marking system that we have now. Uh, and I got 65 points of a possible 600 points. It wasn't 625 at the time, um, at, you know, from my leaving search. So, college wasn't even on the cards and I should say before all of that like I was very late diagnosis um I wasn't diagnosed with um autism until 2013 so I like I, I'm, I, I'm you know I'm, I'm less than than 10 years with my diagnosis my official diagnosis so that you know it, it's very heartening for, for me to see people like Lauren who you know have have discovered themselves uh much earlier because I live most of my life uh, in a state of perpetual fear and anxiety. And, and I didn't realize that that's actually quite an unusual experience. Uh, most people don't go through life um, being that hypersensitive to everything. And it's also very difficult to explain that to other people as well that don't have that experience, uh, that think you're either being melodramatic or just, you know, we stop being so sensitive. And, you know, when I hear that expression, it, it really drives me a little bit nuts now, because it's like saying to someone who's visually impaired, will you stop being so blind, will you? You know, it, it, it's totally, you know, unnecessary um, to, you know, to say to someone to disregard their, their lived experience. So just to, the, so when I was in school, um, I, I, I was doing, you know, I couldn't read or write in, in primary school, um, even though they'd never done an IQ test on me, I, I'd been, you know, diagnosed as being, you know, intellectually disabled, uh, which, you know, without actually confirming that, that's just because back then, if you couldn't read, couldn't write, there was something wrong with you, it, you know, global intelligence. Uh, they didn't really have a great idea of what a specific learning disability looked like. Uh, so thankfully, I learned to read um, when I started in secondary school and did, did an alright junior search, uh, which kind of gave me you know, pause for thought that, you know, maybe maybe everyone wasn't right about me. Maybe there was kind of something going on. But unfortunately, uh, what I found was that, as you know, there's, there's a huge jump between doing the junior search and, and the leaving search, as most people kind of realise. I just wasn't able. Um, I wasn't, and there was no, no, I, I was assessed um, for, for my junior search, but they decided that I didn't need any um, 
accommodations. And unfortunately, that's a manifestation of the um, other condition I have. And I have it on my little blurb there. I'm actually intellectually gifted. I have an IQ of 134. So what happened in my situation was that my natural uh, intelligence was being uh, was masking my disability and vice versa um, to a large extent. So it meant I was neither fish nor fowl nor good red meat. They, they, they didn't see, they thought I was a bit slow, but there was absolutely nothing brilliant or fantastic or, or exceptional going on with me. Um, so, you know, I, I, like I said, I failed my leaving search and there was kind of a big, big scramble in my family at the time. Oh, what will we do with this fella? You know, we can't have him sitting at home. Um, so PLC courses weren't really as, as prevalent as they are now. So what was found for me was uh, my woodwork teacher always felt that I was very, very good at, um, at the subject. So uh, I, I enrolled on the carpentry apprenticeship. Now, I will say uh, being a socially uh, impaired individual on the building site was probably not the best uh, career choice I could have made, because if you're talking about not being too sensitive, you definitely do not want to be sen sensitive if you're working in construction. But what I did realize at that stage was that um, it was going to give me an academic qualification. Uh, so my, my national craft certificate is the same as the first few years of college. So it's a level six award. And I could use it then to, with no leaving search, I could then use it to get into college. Now, subsequent to all this, I, you know, by the time I was 23, which meant I could go back to college as a mature student, um, I didn't even think of college at that stage because written exams were just a non-option for me. You know, um, like I'm profoundly dyslexic and I just was petrified. Like the school system had let me down so, so badly. And I, I keep saying like, you know, I'm a fully qualified teacher myself now. And I look back at the system where professionals are and, you know, we, we really don't cater particularly well. Our system is not set up for people who are neurologically diverse. And I very much take the attitude now that's the system's fault and unfortunately our problem. But I, I'm a bit of a, a militant on this a little bit that, you know, it really is beholden on the system to meet people where they're at. And, you know, thankfully in, in many ways, what we've seen with the accredited grades this year has really benefited a lot of people. Like it's, it's you know, replacing the leaving cert, which is a terminal exam. It's a lot of pressure, one exam, you're in and out, you're done, and if you have a bad day, there's no coming back. Where with continuous assessment, and thankfully with college, college is all about continuous assessment, and it's about you know that that building your knowledge base uh, all the time, and that's what I actually like about college. That you know you're you're when you go in and, and do your final exams, you've already got X number of points in the bank, uh, and that and that's a great weight off you know off your mind as well. Um, so. When I finally did consider going back to college, I, I'd done uh, a, a distance course uh, through the National College of Ireland in first line management because I, I, I when I, I finished my apprenticeship, I, I got a job as a community employment supervisor and um, decided to go back and, and get some qualifications to go with it. Uh, did it part time. It was all assessment based, so there was no exams, and that's the only way I could do it at the time. Because at this stage, I still wasn't even uh, diagnosed with anything. Uh, I just knew, knew I, I couldn't I couldn't sit in an exam hall. And, you know, after that, I, I saw they sent me on a, a further course I could have done, which is a higher diploma in business. Um, but that did involve exams. And it was at that stage I went in and got my first official diagnosis, which was for dyslexia. And I have to say, I know we're, we're talking about autism here, but, you know, I'm neurologically diverse. Like, there's so much bleed between any of the the categorical way we, 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 you know, we label each of these uh, diagnoses. Um, a lot of them kind of fit into each other's bucket anyway. Um, I, I left out that psychologist's room being very, very angry, especially when she told me what my IQ was, that someone who had all this potential and had still managed to fail so badly. Um, and I just, you know, it's one of the reasons why I decided to become a teacher later on, because I wanted to be the type of teacher unfortunately didn't exist in Ireland at the time. And thankfully that situation is changing a bit now, but there's still a long way to go. Um, so that was my first diagnosis. I went back um, and, and like Laura and Michelle there, like my, my mental health was, was not good and it hadn't been good for, for most of my life. 
And you know, unfortunately, you know, there, there was you know this recovery in, in in my story as well, you know, with substance abuse. And you know, unfortunately, still, you know, the, the, that's a journey that a lot of people who are neuro neurologically the, the diverse have to go down because there there are still very very poor services uh, for mental health um, that is a result of neurological difference. And you know, thankfully, you know, substance abuse is quite a well provisioned service. So that's where I got the help. That I needed, and thankfully have, have, have come out the other side much more confident, much more sure of myself, and you know know who I am. Like I, I was really struck by what Lauren shared there about you know trying to fit in, trying to be you know part of the gang, not realizing you know once you understand on on your know, nonverbal communication, most people don't particularly like you because you're different, you're strange, and you know they're never going to be your friends. Uh, was what I discovered. Uh, and especially when you're not being who you truly are. And what I found out was that, you know, first of all, I had to be, I had to learn to like myself first. And after I learned to like myself, I was then able to go on. And this is me. You'll either like me, you won't like me. I like me. And that, that was an amazing step. And, you know, I hope I'm not going off topic too much, but that kind of mental attitude is going to serve you very well in college as well. Don't, don't be too concerned about what other people think of you. Because in a lot of ways, it's none of your business what other people think of you. Once you're happy with where you are and what you're doing, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're going to be jealous of maybe how successful you are academically. Uh, so just be mindful of that. Don't, don't believe everything that's said to you. Um, but going back to the, the website, like it's an absolutely fantastic resource in so many different ways. Um, like for, for college life, I, I can't talk too much because all my college has been part time. So even though while I was on campus, it was usually in the evenings, it was much quieter. Uh, which was really suited me. I'm not sure how I, I deal with a really busy daytime course. Um, but again, the facilities are there. There are quiet rooms now. There are different different facilities there. And, you know, you know, thankfully, the one thing the pandemic has showed us that, you know, hopefully the colleges will adapt as well. And, you know, being able to do virtual classes and lectures will become part of the mainstream. So, you know, watch this space. Um, but the other thing is, all like just the practical skills of you know cooking for yourself, washing your clothes. If you haven't done these things before, you know just knowing and you know maybe not being comfortable asking people how to do it. It's great to know that it's their one-stop shop. Um, the social aspect, I'd say, find things you know that 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 you can relate to your own skill set. So like you know the great thing about college is there's something for everyone there. Like college is it's not like school. People are that little bit older, more mature. Um, less childish in a way like you know secondary school is all about kind of clicks and, and fitting in college is a bit more about you know you will find a lot of differently thinking people uh so it's all about just finding your tribe and and, and you know being comfortable with people who are comfortable being with you um on the academics again it has changed so much like you know the fact that you know the assistive technology has changed my life so i, I just finished a, a twenty thousand word dissertation and it's all been done on Dragon Dictate. Um, you know, that, that was mind blowing for me. And same when I was doing my postgrad three years ago, I, I, I used that tech to, to sit my final written exams as well. Uh, so that, that is just so beneficial. Um, so the accommodations, and the way I'd say about accommodations, don't be afraid to ask for them because accommodations are not them going out of their way or the college going out of their way to help you. The way I look at accommodations, this is a system that's not been designed for me and accommodations are their way of trying to level that playing field to make it fairer to you because you're already at a massive disadvantage. So when, when you're asking for accommodation, don't go with kind of a begging bowl attitude. I'd really say this is something that I need to succeed here and be very strong about it and be sure what you want. Don't be on, you know, meet people halfway, but, but just be understand that, you know, I've been told no, a lot of times where I shouldn't have been told no. And thankfully through utilizing the student union and even the citizens information center and you know, you know, people that understand you know, what you should be entitled to. Um, that really helps. And like I said, you know, have the conversation, but signing up for yourself and telling people how you feel about how you're treated can never be discarded as well. So if you're feeling frustrated, say that. You know, I'm being frustrated about what's been said here about me at the moment or or things like that. Um, 
So yeah, just to, to, to roll on. So at the moment, I, I'm working for a company called Salesforce. So I, I started with Salesforce uh, just under three years ago through um, another program run by uh, a head called the WAN program, which is a willing, able and mentoring program for graduates with disabilities. And the reason I'm kind of sharing that, you know, I, I spent most of my career either unemployed or underemployed. And that's the first time I've been able to get a career as you know, a company where I can actually build a career. Uh, and it's allowed me to, you know, be a, a, a you know, an important part of a, of a multinational team where my, you know, where my, my view being different is actually valued because it is different. I, I don't get, you know, and that's, that's why I look at it as well. People, you know, school is hard, college is a little bit easier. But what I'd say to anyone is when you actually get home to, to the workforce, in some ways, it actually gets easier the more you go on because people will look at what makes you unique, what value can you bring to the team, uh, rather than being so concerned about just fishing in with everything around you. Um, and that, that's the main message I give. And this website will give you the supports to, to be yourself and still succeed. Um, so I don't know how I'm doing on time there, Aoife, but... Uh, no, no, that's great, Colm. And um, thanks very much. I really liked what you said about the accommodations because I think sometimes, especially as Irish people, we're almost afraid to reach out and ask for help when we think we don't want to put somebody out. Oh, God, they're going to be annoyed at me if I ask. But you're dead right in what you're saying. You are entitled to it and you are able to ask. And it's just about leveling the playing field for you. So if you feel that you're not being supported in college or there is something that could be done to support you better, do say it. I really like that message. I think it's really, really important. And you're very, very colourful background. and everything that's you know happened in your education journey and look how far you've come so it's great to hear that it's a really good intro into billy because billy's going to tell people you know what happens if you don't get the points that you had your heart set on or the course that you had your heart set on so we'll move on to billy now thank you colin really really very much for that and billy you can go ahead and take it away now thanks very much uh, thanks lauren and colin i really enjoyed those presentations and just as a point of reference colin you're not the oldest person in the room I just turned 53 days ago, so I'm a few years older than you. Happy birthday uh, to you both. Thanks very much. I'll take any happy birthday I can get. I'll squeeze the last out of it. So really what I wanted to do today is just to give you a little bit of context. And I think actually both Lauren and Colm are excellent examples of um, career path planning is not what we are taught that it is. And um, we tend to be um, fed this narrative from a very early age that we have this very simple linear planning. You do primary school, you do secondary school, and then you do third level education. And if you don't do it that way, that in some way you are using back doors, or it's an alternative, or it's special. When in reality, it's not. Your path is your path. And all of the pathways that I'm gonna outline um, really are absolutely appropriate pathways for you to get to where it is that you want to go. And the journey, the length, there's no set length of time. Some people, they might decide, well, I'd like to do, if you don't mind, Lauren, I'll use psychology. Some people might decide, well, I want to do a psychology degree full time on campus in a college, and I might do that in three or four years. Other people might decide, well, actually, no, I'm going to do my psychology degree part time and study remotely, and I'm going to take nine years to do it. You still get a psychology degree. There is no difference, it's still the same level. So I have a couple of slides and websites. And again, I've, I've had a, a, a run through the website again, and it's a, again, a really, really good source of um, a particular perspective as you enter um, higher education. There's, there's an assumption that when we go past 18, we're ready for life now, we're fully packed, away you go now, put on your backpack and off you go into college and everything's gonna be fine. I would argue that in many cases, the transition from second level into third or higher or further education or apprenticeships or work and study, um, that journey can be actually far more challenging than the journey from primary into secondary or um, uh, nursery into primary because it's much more fluid and it, there are more assumptions about your ability to navigate and to move through that journey. And it's interesting because as it happens, you know, tomorrow is when the CAO offers come out. And that's for many people, again, there's even today I was having a conversation with somebody about it, 
and a parent rang me to ask me for some information and they had no idea of vacant places. They had no idea that there wasn't first round, there was first round, second round, third round, fourth round and fifth round. And they didn't realize that that chessboard of places that happens in Ireland keeps moving for the next six weeks and that you still have choices and options within that that many people don't realize um, that they have or are available. So I suppose my first piece of advice to you would be, you need to use the language of choice in your own language around your career. That you have choices, you're not stuck. That you always, there are always options, there are always ways of approaching and navigating through um, higher, further and um, continued studies. There's always ways to move through that. And that when we look at those, that, that pathway planning, and um, the first, I'm just, Bear with me now when I share my screen with you for a second. One of the most important concepts to just get your head around is this, the National Framework of Qualifications. And this is the entire education system based on one simple graphic. And the reality of it is, as you navigate this, there is no right way to navigate it, only the right way for you. So when we tend to think about junior cycle, Junior cycle is level three on the national framework of qualification. And for many students, they will get that junior cycle qualification in secondary school. And then you have the leaving cert and the leaving cert at LCA and the traditional leaving cert that covers level four and level five. But the majority of students, when they're leaving school, they're leaving school with the level five certification. So they're leaving halfway up that ladder, if you want to use the ladder analogy. And as they navigate that journey, it gets really interesting after that, because the one size fits all model stops after level five. Everyone doing Irish, English, maths, history, geography, whatever your elective subjects are, um, that really stops. And there's a massive jump between level five and level six for personal choice. The amount of personal choice that's available to you at, up to your leaving cert, you have a certain amount of personal choice but there is an awful lot of prescribed work that you have to do in, the, in relation to subjects. So when we think about the next three levels, level six, seven, and eight, and Colin put it really well that his certification in carpentry and his apprenticeship was level six, but there was a level seven he could do that he could continue on with. I have a lot of young people that would come to see me for career guidance who might be really interested, love woodwork, class construction, love engineering, but don't want to do a full degree, and actually, there are amazing courses out there involving um, wood manufacturing, furniture design that are at le level six, level seven and level eight courses. So when we look at level six, we call them higher certificate courses. And they are generally available in the institutes of technology across the whole country and in our new technological universities. So TUD, Dublin Technological University and Munster Technological University, and there will be more of them. They're basically an amalgamation of a number of institutes of technology. The course that Lauren spoke about doing first, the PLC course, when she sp spoke about engaging with that program, the majority of PLC courses are at level five. And they're a really, really, really good option that if let's say the Leaving Cert felt a bit overwhelming for you, or because you were doing seven completely different subjects and you liked two of them, but really didn't like five of them, you didn't get a chance to shine. So I would have a lot of students, and I've one young autistic woman that I'm working with at the moment, and she's going to do her PLC um, in September. She's really excited about being able to focus 100% in an area she's interested in. Now she could go on to higher education and she will do, but she wants a year where she's not doing seven completely different things, where she gets to focus her mind and build their learning skills, build their transport skills, as in getting buses, going to college, time management, following timetables, organizing her work more independently. And she's using that PLC program and they are absolutely exceptional PLC programs out there across all of our colleges of further education. And they're run through the Education and Training Boards of Ireland. And I'll show you, you can check them all out on the Qualifax website and I'll show you that in a moment. But they also, you can check them on your local. And a lot of them tend to be a little bit closer to, so if you didn't want to travel as far for your first year, 
you might start off with a with a PLC program, and many of them are accepting applications right now. Your level seven and your level eight courses are your ordinary degree and your honors degree. And when you apply for CAO, you're applying, you can apply for up to 10 level six and seven together and up to 10 level eight courses. And for many people, that process is done. They've done that process. They got, they registered by the 1st of February or a late application by the 1st of May. But you can still apply for CAO. You can apply for CAO now under vacant places. So if there are courses that are not full, something that you like the look of, that you can put in a late application now, or you can amend your CAO application now based on an available place in a course that you might like. So you might have done your CAO very quickly. You might have changed your mind. And I'll show you a little bit about, about, about um, navigating those. And then level, level nine and level 10, as Colm spoke about, he's dying to jump into a level 10. I am too, Colm, but I just haven't really got the nerve for it yet. But I'm definitely, I would love to do it. Um, a level nine is a master's degree or postgraduate diploma. And the majority of those are part-time. And they really allow you to specialize and focus in things that you're really interested in. I have four postgrads done, and each one of them were like a hobby because I was getting to do something I just liked. I was writing essays about stuff I enjoyed. So it never felt like work. It never felt like effort. From Lauren's perspective, when she finishes her psychology degree, we've probably about 90, over 90 postgrads in Ireland that she can do that will give her a professional qualification on top of her psychology degree. And actually that's when all the interesting stuff happens because there are so many options available at postgraduate level. And you can do them very much part-time, you can do them full-time, but you have massive flexibility around that. And whatever journey you take to get to level eight, and whether that journey takes you four years, five years, six years, 10 years, the journey is about you. It's not about other people's expectations of how long it's going to take. So for many people, it's about making it work for many adults I work with. I always say to them, you can't transform your life and suddenly stop living and do nothing but study. For many people, they need to go part-time for a while. And that works absolutely appropriate for many people. So I want to show you kind of two websites. If you're at the point now where you've got your results, you have your points in front of you, you're either happy or not happy with those points. But just depending on what your offer is tomorrow, I want to just give you a little bit more information about where to get some really good information around this. So. This is the CAO website. And when you go on to the homepage in CAO, okay, you'll see this basic page in front of you. And there's a couple of really important sections I want to emphasize to you. The first one is here, offers and acceptance. And the second one is here, available places. So let me just show you offers and acceptance for a moment. And this is a little bit logistical, but it's important to get your head around that. So you see now that everybody, many, many people applied for level eight and level seven and six courses. There's only one of them. They can't do both. So if a young person in the, or an adult in the next couple of days, in round one offers opens the seventh, which is tomorrow, and you have to apply as in state whether you want a course that's offered to you or not by the 13th. Now, if you've been offered two courses, as many, many young people, will have been offered two courses. You can only take one. So one goes back into the system. So let's say I apply to do a business course in Waterford Institute of Technology. And I also apply to do a, a level eight and I apply to do a level six and a seven course or six or seven in Waterford or Carlow or somewhere else. I might get two offers. I'll be offered my level eight and my level six and my seven. Now, don't believe that and not necessarily think the level eight is the best option. If you only want to lock in for two years, take the level six. If you're doing well on that level six, you can continue on and do your level seven and your level eight. It'll take you the same length of time. In most cases, it'll take you the same length of time. So when those offers close, all those courses that have not been accepted go back into the system again and are re-offered then in round two which is the 20th of September. 
Now this gets very tight then, you've two days to accept or not accept. The speed then starts, and part of that's impacted by predicted grades this year, and aggregated grades. Round three then, the 28th to the 30th. Round four, the 5th of October to the 7th. And round five, the 12th to the 14th. So that I have seen so many times over the years, somebody gets offered in the first round, their fourth choice on their list. And they're going, oh, I really don't want that and I'm not happy, accept your course. You put it down as being your fourth most preferred. In round two, you might get your third or your second option. And even though you've accepted your fourth, CAO will constantly try and bring you up that list. So even though you've accepted number four, they come back and say, well, we can now offer you number three or number two. And you can decide, well, actually, no, I, I'm okay with number four. I'm not going to take number three. But maybe in round three or four, they might offer you number one. And the choice is always with you. Their goal is to bring you as close to number one as possible. And that's why they will keep coming back and making offers to you. So that we are by no way, when you get your offer tomorrow, by no way is that process closed. That process goes on now for an additional six weeks. And as a result of that, many, many, many courses will have available places, places that are not full. Now, and this list changes. What's really important, this list changes really regularly. So if you're in the situation where you're thinking, oh, maybe I want to apply for a different course, or maybe I want to see, I didn't get what I want. I want to see what my options are, what other things I could do. You click into available places and click into your available places course. And there it is now, you see last updated on the fourth, correct as of the sixth. And it gets updated quite frequently, up to daily in some cases, over the next couple of weeks. There's the only level eight course before any offer has been made that we know now there are places on. Level seven and level six, you can see there's quite a small list. That will change to at least three or four pages tomorrow or the day after. And you'll have a lot more spaces available. And then you can think, well, if you like the look of, so for example, there are many students who love history and don't realize that heritage studies is a really interesting kind of local history course that has bits of tourism in it, bits of business in it. So when you click into it, it'll bring you straight to the website of that course. It'll tell you it's a level six course, which is two years full time. It'll tell you all about the course, the modules that you will study, Irish and European history, natural heritage and geography, linguistic trans, tra, um, traditions, reading Irish literature. And again, all the information is in there about that course. And you might suddenly realize, Oh, I had no idea that course was out there. So now when now is the time to really get in to having a good look at the kinds of things that you might like to do and keeping an eye on the available places course courses as they come up and as they change. Now, if you suddenly see one you like, you just either re-enter your CAO as in you log into your CAO and you make a chain, you can go in and change your application but you must put the new course you want as number one. So you go in and you change your course order and you put heritage studies or whatever at number one on your list. And in the next round, um, it's very likely then you'd be offered a place unless there was huge numbers of people applying for those places. But the key is to, to, to um, get your application in as quick and as soon as you see it and if you're interested in it. But also if there was one of those courses that you really like, you can apply for it now at this stage. So there's a lot more flexibility in the system and CAO does everything they possibly can really to accommodate. And they're very good if you email them in a question, they're excellent. But also when you think about PLC courses, so this is a great website, Qualifax. So if you wanna check out what PLC courses are available, either in your area or maybe in a city that you wanted to move to or you liked, all you do here is you click in to students, course finder, and you can either look up CAO courses or PLC courses. So if I wanted to look up PLC courses, remember these are level five and level six courses, one year or two years. Now let's say I want to look up courses in my county, the best county. 
slight bias there, but Wexford is the best county. And I want to look up either every course that's available in Wexford and see everything, or if I want to look up courses that are connected to people or science or business. But if I just look up every course, that tells me that there are 46 PLC courses in County Wexford that I can apply for. And you can see level five and level six. That's the level those courses are at. Gen, you have to do level five first before you do level six. So usually that's kind of one and two years. So you can see the kinds of courses, some of them might be full, but the key is you can click in and generally you can apply directly to those colleges immediately. And you apply via the college website itself. And the application process is generally very sim simple. And there are really no fees other than a small amount of admissions fees. You might have, let's say if you were doing beauty therapy, you might have to buy a certain amount of kit, but there aren't fees as such in, in as the way there would be, let's say in CAO programs and in institutes of technology. So you can see the range of courses, healthcare, tourism, legal studies, pre-nursing, office, pre-third level science, pre-apprenticeship programs. So again, these are excellent courses. They are in no way less than other programs. They are wonderful um, opportunities to learn in a smaller environment, to be more specialized in your learning and more focused, and to be part of your pathway into further higher and continuing education. And you might do a level five and work for a couple of years, go back and do your level six, maybe your level seven full-time for a year or two, and finish your degree part-time by doing your level eight part-time a number of nights a week. There is massive flexibility. And as Colm said, the changes that will happen now because of COVID and because of online learning and the fact that universities and colleges are realizing one is as valid as the other. And that for many people that space to engage with online learning in a space where you're more comfortable and to manage the amount of, the amount of sensory overload you might get in a larger campus. And as Colm said, like studying at night, doing evening study, DCU, UCD, Dublin Technological University, they all have amazing night programs. And for many students who maybe want to work a bit during the day or want a more quiet college experience, and my college experience was 120 students in the entire building for four years. It was pure bliss. I had no sensory overload. There was no masses of crowds. There was 25, 30 people in each year group, and that was it. It was a very, very managed environment. And I loved every minute of it because it really suited the way I wanted to learn and the way I liked learning. So those two websites, uh, Qualifax and uh, the CAO website are really important kind of um, points that you might look at now and kind of focus on uh, over the next couple of weeks. And um, also obviously the As I Am website is an excellent source. Um, so to help you settle in and identify the areas but also, and, and I, I completely agree with Colm, and, and Lauren, you made this point as well, the idea of accommodations and adaptations are an attempt, not far enough, I would argue, but an attempt to equalize the playing field. And there is no gratitude, no thank yous. I mean, be grateful for people being kind towards you, but don't, you don't, this excessive gratitude, as Aoife said, we're Irish and we don't want to necessarily these are your entitlements to make life easier for you. These actually equal, and they allow your natural ability to shine. And that's what educators want. We want to get an opportunity to see the best of your learning. And by adapting your assessment, by adapting the method we deliver, by adapting our expectations of product and how you produce your learning, all of those adaptations can have a huge impact. And many schools, I know my school, we're doing it now, we're using universal design for learning to adapt all of our lesson plans so that when we design lessons, we're designing lessons to meet the needs of all learners. We are cognizant that as a home ec teacher is my base subject, that I have to be aware of the sensory impact of my classroom. That if I'm doing certain things, other students can find that quite overwhelming. There can be smell, there can be noise, there can be movement. There's loads of things I need to be cognizant of and sounds. Um, so really that gives you a bit of a whistle stop tour of some of the focused areas that um, might be helpful or useful. From, can I just, if there was anything, Colm or Lauren, that you think 
that I maybe I didn't mention there that might be helpful for anybody or that I could expand a bit further on? No, I think it has everything there. No, yeah. fairness, Billy, for a fellow for a fellow from Wexford, no, I think you did very well there. No, no, I, I really, I really can't correct you. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would jump in there to say I think you did really well to cover everything too. You know, along with my job and as I am, I actually teach on PLCs in further ed, so I'm a big advocate for it. I did it myself with my own route to, to doing my degree, and I think there's not enough kind of emphasis put on that choice for people too. Like you're saying, Billy, it's not that one stop shop straight from second level into college. There's lots of other options. And I think everybody here tonight hit on that really well to show that you don't need to take that linear approach. There's lots of ways around it. You can take your breaks in between years if you need to, you can do a PLC and you can move on. So thank you all so, so much for your input. I hope it's helpful to people that were watching or will watch over the next few days. Um, I don't see any questions in the box. But if people do have questions down the line, if they would like to put them into the feedback uh, form, and if I feel that's something that I can't answer, I'm happy to consult with Billy or Lauren or Colm and see if I could get their insight to help people out as much as we can. And thank you all so much, uh, the panelists for tonight, for all your information and your wise words. And for anybody that's watching and will watch in the next few days, thank you so much for your engagement. And we really hope that you get a lot out of the website. We're going to record this and it's going to be on YouTube. So if you think it will be beneficial to somebody else, do please let them know. And if everybody's happy, we can leave it there. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.